I am Bill Cartwright with Living Right with Bill Cartwright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cartwright. And today, the Super Millennials on vacation. So the Super Millennial is gone, but guess what? I've got a special guest. And I'm introducing her to Stress Mastery, uh, the community, the podcast, the world for the first time. She is, her name is Peggy Romero. She is a serial entrepreneur. And we're, you'll understand that as we start to talk about her. She is a self-made millionaire that has done all kinds of business from owning a hairdressing shop to owning several insurance agencies and developing that. So she's really done some cool things in real estate. She's going to show you what a serial entrepreneur looks like. And more importantly, she is now in her transition and she is going out to help other people. She's currently transitioning. She's working on a new book. We'll talk about that. She's going into coaching and she really has her purpose and her mission is aligned to help young women. Not that she can't work with everybody, but her passion is to help young women find their way into the entrepreneurial circle. So welcome, Peggy. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. It's great to have you. Did it, was that enough introduction for you? Yeah, that was plenty. <laughs> <laughs> so I know, Peggy, I actually know you're a very humble person too. You're not one to ever talk about this stuff. You're just starting to rebrand yourself now, correct? Right. I'm really excited about my new transition. I've been working and working and working one goal after another, trying to get to the place that I'm at now. So I thank you for helping me to get here. I'm super excited about my future endeavors. We're lucky, we're lucky to have you in the family because when they learn about you, there's going to be a lot of people that want to connect with you and you're still in the process of building your website and building everything. So they're going to have to connect through us. Oh, that's okay. I, I can, I can do that. I screen everything. All donations come to Bill Courtright. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so let's talk about it. Let's get into it a little bit. And so right now you're in your current transition. You're writing a book uh, called The Guardian Angel, correct? Correct. And so, My first us, book ever. Yeah. So tell us a little bit. What's the book? What's the book about? And what audience is it geared toward? I actually think that uh, the book can help anybody who ever feels stuck in their life. Or who doesn't? I mean, I. It's open. It. It is just showing like it doesn't matter where you are. You can get to where you want to go. You just have to plan it and work towards it. It's amazing. And 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 it's so easy because we're gonna go into your life a little bit and we're gonna we'll get a really a look because, you know, a lot of people think that for you to be successful, especially it's like the million dollar mark seems to be everybody's magic number. They think once you become a millionaire, you don't have any more problems, right? Yeah, That's sure. not true, right? But <laughs> what happens is that people, it, it, it's a goal that many people have. It's a great but, goal. And now the thing is that most people believe to get there that you have to have some sort of help, education, you have to have some sort of family background, you have to have some sort of pedigree to do that. And that's mm -hmm. just not true, is it? Right. I don't have, a, I do have an education now because I decided in my 40s that I wanted to get an education, <laughs> but um, I don't have any pedigree, that's for sure. I don't have a great background and pretty much started with nothing, so... And let's start, let's start there. So you do have pedigree, by the way, now. <laughs> you set your pedigree now. But let's go back. Let's go back a little bit, talk about your, just a little bit about the family of where you grew up in, how you grew up. Um, I grew up in a nice Catholic family that had seven kids. And I was the oldest daughter. So I had a ton of responsibility. And parents who just expected a lot out of me, I guess. I'll just say that. We didn't have much money, so I had to help a lot. And, you know, my mom had a bunch of kids and not enough hands, so mm -hmm. it was expected for me to help. And I was actually just used to it and happy to help, honestly. And so you grew up, you know, so like this, this, this week's um, 
this week's topic is identity. And one of the things I want to go talk about a little bit is how our identity influences our lives, right? So your early identity is you're the, you're the oldest sibling, the oldest daughter, correct? Right. And, and so I was you, raised to be a housewife. That yeah, was so, my, uh, and so that's that was my identity. So you were a young kid. You really were responsible for a lot of the siblings, correct? I really was. When I was um, in the seventh grade, my mom got her first job. Well, she did have a job in uh, working in retail stores at Christmas time to get the store discount and a little bit of extra money. But other than that, she never worked outside the home. And then when she did get a job, she had it just a couple months. There was a factory that was in walking distance of our house and she got a job there and smashed her hand. And that changed me from daughter to mother overnight of wow. those kids. Wow. Yeah. So can you, can you touch on that just a little bit? Or well, the responsibilities, your age and everything? What was your yeah, I was young. I just really wanted to be a kid and just help with dinner. But all of a sudden, I really did have to like make sure that the homework was done. We lived in New York at the time, and my father worked in New York City. So he had to leave real early in the morning, work his shift, and come home. You know, he got home, maybe, you know, by dinner. But I had all this responsibility to try and get these brats to do their homework, do their laundry. <laughs> Give me your laundry. Help yeah. me. Can you guys please vacuum before dad gets home? And all this stuff. So I, I went from helping my mom cook to cooking. And I had yeah. an awesome neighbor that, that taught me a lot. And um, yeah, all of a sudden, honestly, I was the mom. Well, my poor mom, her hand was literally smashed to smithereens. And this was in the 70s. And she was in the hospital for months, got down to weighing like 80 pounds. She came home for a few weeks. I think she was gone three months. Hard to know when you're a kid back then, you know. Uh, came home for just a little bit of time after being, you know, hospitalized. And no kids could visit back then. So we didn't mm -hmm. even see her. She came home. She was a bag of bones, I remember. And she was about to have a nervous breakdown. So she had a sister that was a nun. So she went to go live at the convent with her. I don't know how long she was gone. It seemed like a real long time. Right. Then she came back home again, but had to go in and out of rehab hospital. And I, I'm sure she was just struggling to survive. My poor mom. Yeah. And so, and then you are taking care of the kids. So now you're, you've grown up very quickly, correct? Very quickly. And so we yeah. look at the identity and we, we, we understand here on the show how the stages work, right? So you have your stage one set, but that imperial stage, when you're going into your adolescence, you're actually growing up very quickly. So you have the identity right. of being very responsible. Would you say mm -hmm. that? So now let's talk a little bit about how your life progresses. So you're kind of like you said, you were raised to be a housewife yep. and you became a young bride, correct? I did, yes. Um, I ha ended up getting married when I was only 18 and I had my daughter Melissa when I was 19. And I just wanted to be the best housewife in the world. That was like, my whole focus was just not wanting to disappoint anyone, just taking everything I knew and being the best wife I could. And I had this goal to be a better parent than my parents were to mm -hmm. us because they were really distracted, and I guess, under duress. So I, you know, when you're a kid, I'm never going to do that when I have kids. And I'm never going to do this when I have kids. I really meant it. I, I really meant it. And I really did it. And uh, I'm sure that I fell short a few places, but that was my whole goal. Don't Be worry, we're gonna have Melissa people. call in. We're gonna have Melissa oh, yeah, call yeah. in. Don't worry, no, no. So, <laughs> so I and I, I understand it completely. So, so that first marriage is going, and you're doing. You're young, and you you're kind of living your identity, right? You're you're a housewife. Yep. I'm trying to. Thing. And the marriage, what happens? And you you, you well, share what you feel like sharing, Peggy. I'm not gonna put you on the spot. Unfortunately, my husband I met, you know, being a partying teenager. So we got married because oh. my dad told us to, and uh, he didn't want to grow up. So he ended up being an alcoholic. So my marriage was uh, one of living in hell, really. Okay. Um, always wishing that it could be better and always hoping that he would grow up and change, mm -hmm. but he never did. So uh, fortunately, which I didn't know at the time, of course, he decided he was never going to get anywhere as long as he was with me. And, uh, and he made that but, statement to you. Yes. He made Go ahead, that statement. Share, share this because this is a really 
important moment in your in your life that shaped your life all the way to today share that moment. it really did so thank heavens it was new year's and i said hey and he'd been you know in and out of rehab seriously probably broke up four or five times by now and i was uh 26 years old and i said hey let's make our goals for the new year finally i have a sober husband let's get our act together and he goes oh yeah i've been meaning to talk to you about that um I just don't think I'm going to get anywhere as long as I'm with you. So um, I want a divorce. And you don't think you're going to get anywhere as long as you're with me? Out of nowhere, right? It just comes in yeah. and that's your statement. So here yeah. you are. You got your, your, you got a baby, right? You have one child at that time, correct? Yes. No, I had two. I had, oh, two, yeah, two, two, I had two, my two boy children. Tyler too. That's okay. Yeah. So you have two children at that time. Yeah, we stayed married 10 years. Okay. So you, I mean, you put your time in. Right? I did. I tried. Right? So, yeah. so then all of a sudden you're on your own. And this is kind of where the serial entrepreneur comes out because you got to understand what is amazing about your story is, is that there was nobody showing you what life could be. You made the decision to do that. Can you talk about that a little bit? How this all, how it starts? How does this, how do you start becoming Peggy Romero, a super entrepreneur, because <laughs> it's an amazing story. Go on and start. Um, yeah, I started out because he said, I can't, I'm not going to get anywhere as long as I'm with you. I just thought, you know, I've worked so hard at this. How can you even say that to me? I just couldn't believe it. So I set out to do better than him. Well, I never really worked. I did uh, when I was 20. Um, I wanted to have like a side job because I had to take care of the kids and you know, we only had one car and I couldn't trust them already to come home after work. So I got this idea that I could drop them off at work and um, I started a little basket company and I named it the basket case. And I was making money at that. I made little gift baskets. Um, people could order them from me and I actually started making money. It gave me a lot of confidence. And so, so you're then, doing this while you're married still, correct? I did that while so, I was yes. married. Yes, okay, all right, so you started, okay. Yeah. So then um, I never did anything else. He really did want me to stay home and he, he made okay money. So I did looking back, I'm sure it was just because he knew he didn't want me to fly the coop. So he didn't let me out of the coop. So <laughs> finally, when I did, I was getting my hair cut. My heart was broken. And I was telling my hairdresser, Dolores, who I'd gone to a long time. Wow. All of a sudden, Mark left me and she was like, well, thank God, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody anyway, knows me for you, though. You ever notice exactly, that? Yeah. Exactly. So I was like, oh, man, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. And she goes, you can do anything you want. Why don't you go get your hairdresser license? I'll hire you. And I was like, you'd hire me? Because, of course, I didn't think I was pretty enough to be a hairdresser, smart enough to be a hairdresser. Didn't even think I could pass a test at that point. And so I was like, okay, well, that was the first offer that came along. So I went ahead and got my hairdresser license. She said, hey, go to Barber College. It only takes nine months to get through and I'll help you know everything. You'll have the same license for hair. You can do women's hair, colors, everything. Don't worry, I'll teach you everything when you get out of school. Okay, so I went and did it and then I got the job from her. And she was going along teaching me everything and I was confident, I couldn't believe it. I had customers coming from downtown where I'd gone to school, out to the you know outer county to get their hair cut. It gave me a boost of confidence. People really liked me. Then she comes to work one day and said, she had this baby. She was pregnant when she offered me the job. And she had this baby and she said, my baby's autistic. This is my last month working here. I'm putting the salon up for sale. Oh my gosh, how could you do that? I just started making money. She's like, well, can't you buy it? No, I don't have a thing. I have nothing. And anyways, I figured it out with her and I ended up getting that hair salon. And so you that bought was, the salon, right? I did. I, I bought see. the salon. Right? And so then that was my business. So I immediately was like, okay, well, I, I can hire people. I'll get people to rent chairs. Oh, I'll start buy a tanning booth. Oh, I'll get a nail person. And so I made the salon better and better. So I got that all running. And then I was like, okay, well, I did that. So now I'm going to go to real estate school because there's probably good money in real estate. I'm going to go to real estate school. So did anything, <laughs> did anything drive you there? Because now you got your business running, and did anything drive you to go into real estate? I don't know. I just yeah. think that finally I had this confidence yes. that I could do it. Like, oh, I don't have to just be a housewife 
<laughs> waiting to see what my husband's next idea is. I can, I can do it. So I was the hairdresser because, well, I did used to cut my sister's hair and my brothers and <laughs> my friends, you know, mostly because, you know, we grew up poor and didn't have any money. So right. my mom used to tape our bangs to our head to cut them. And I thought there's got to be a better way. Let me figure that out. <laughs> so anyways, I just got confidence and I thought, okay, well, I did the hairdressing because she wanted me to, you know, she right. gave me the idea and I thought right. I could make money. What do I want to do? So I decided to go to real estate school. So then I did that and I was, and then I just worked like whatever I do, I just want to do the best that I can. So I ended up being realtor of the month in Gresham, Oregon, three months in a row. I couldn't believe it. My picture. In the so paper. now you went from owning that because I, I, I want to bring another story into the real estate for a second too. So now I want people to get the idea that she went from, she's, she's single mom. She went and got her hair license, worked as a hairdresser. Finally, she's making money. Then she buys the place turns the place into a successful business. How about the customer that came to you for possible fix up home? Oh yeah, yeah, so I was sitting there <laughs> telling, probably, probably telling her that I am going to real estate school. Right. So she says, oh, well I have a house um, that I need to sell and it's in terrible shape. Maybe you can list it for me. And I'm like, well, tell me about this house because now I already, I'm cutting her hair, coloring her hair. I, I already, now I want this house. I want to buy the house. Mm -hmm. So I go over there and look out with my dad and my dad's like, no way, you're biting off way more than you can chew. But dad, I live in an apartment now. This could be my own house. I could make it into three apartments. And uh, my parents really didn't want me to buy it, but I, I talked to the lady about it again, got a hold of her, end up buying that house. And um, I loved it. I loved fixing up that house. I could like walk in the door of this house that had the 12 by 12 carpet squares nailed to the walls. <laughs> <laughs> classy joint. <laughs> Real classy. Yeah. And I could just see like, oh, if I took that down and move this wall, I could do this. I could get new cabinets and I could make this really nice. And uh, I, I bought it. I bought it. It was in such bad shape that we had buckets in the attic catching the water. That's how bad that house was. And that was the first one you flipped, right? So you are yeah. now in real estate. Now mm -hmm. I want everybody to follow this story because this is for <laughs> by herself. There's nobody, nobody around. She's doing this with no. the kids. Right? I never even had, I had I had two kids and and yeah, yep. I didn't even have a boyfriend most of the time. Yeah. yeah. And so you you went in. You, you got your real estate license, became one of the top sellers in real estate, and then you learned how to flip houses. And you still yeah. do that today, right? You still, yeah, you love, still fix them up. Yeah, yeah, you fix them up, flip it. So now you're starting to build some wealth. You know, you're starting to build a little bit of wealth, right? I mean, you're not, not like you are today, but yeah, you're really- I didn't have, you know, Yeah, I didn't have much. I was always nervous about making all my payments, but what I did do at that house was, I turned the basement into a legal apartment so that I could rent out the apartment and that paid more than half my rent. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. So, so then that it gave me time and, you know, to do other things like get my house fixed. Then I, um, still on the hair salon. I just worked a little bit mm -hmm. and then I had that house. I quit. Oh, that, no, I was still doing real estate part time. And then I met Dean and married him. Okay. This is and your second husband now, right? It is. And yeah. so I, I got married to Dean and then I sold the hair salon because if I wasn't going to work there, I figured I might as well sell it. So you made it a good profit it. selling it, correct? Yeah, I made a decent yeah, profit. Yeah. yeah, we always got to look at the money, Mark, here. We're oh, talking yeah. entrepreneurial, right? We want yeah. everybody, I wanted them to understand how you became a millionaire because I want oh, them yeah. to really see, okay, okay, good. Yeah. Go oh, yeah. So then I did yeah. that and I, I did make a profit. And then um, I, I said, okay, well, I told Dean. I didn't really want any more kids, but he'd never had any kids. And so over our dating time, I said, all right, here's the deal. When we get married, if I get pregnant in the first three months, I'll have a baby. And if we don't, you can never ask me again. That was our deal. Because I was, I think I was 34 at the time. So then he said, okay, that's the deal. Well, I got pregnant immediately. So I figured, all right, God wanted me to have a baby. So right. I had my sweet little Kimberly. I, I sold the hair salon and we lived in the house when we were running out the basement apartment mm -hmm. and Dean had a good job. So he, he liked me to stay home and I like staying home. So I just stayed home and fixed up that house 
that we were okay. living in. I loved okay. it. And then my sister, Jenny, sold a travel agency. So I'm like, oh, teach me how to do that. I want to sell travel. We can, I can sell yeah. travel. I can work part time. I can, you know, just sell it to my friends and I can make money and I can get the travel agent card and go on vacations for free or not, you know, little or nothing. So that was super exciting. So, so then now I, I want everybody to realize, so we've gone from hair salon, hairdresser, <laughs> hair salon to real estate to construction worker to travel agent. <laughs> yeah. Right? <laughs> So I think mean, we, we start to put it together, right? It's something else. I know I'm crazy. <laughs> so let's go there. Let's start. Let's I stay just, at the travel I like agency. Everything. Yeah. I just like everything. I I don't know why. I'm just interested in it, and I just like it. So anyway, so I worked with my sister for a little while, and um, we had our own like side thing going. I don't remember why we quit, but. We probably just both went on to do something else. I don't remember. Anyway, so then I was just really like, just, you know, part. Not really that. I mean, my husband had good money and I liked being with my kids. My okay. kids, two older ones, had had to get drug around with me all this time. Mm -hmm. through everything that I did. So it was really nice to just be settled and stable for a while. And I figured, well, I can do some more stuff later. So then, unfortunately, Dean got sick and died. So you, your your right second now. husband passed then, right? Yes. Yes. So Kimberly was three, and I was like, oh, no. Now what am I going to do? Right. <laughs> so I got a little bit of life insurance money, and I mean little. And I took that. And uh, use that, I could either pay off all of the bills that I had, because Dean had a whole bunch of hospital bills, of, unfortunately. I had all these choices to make. Anyways, what I decided to do, which my parents were completely against once again, was that I decided to take that money that I had and go build a house out in the country. Because I knew that I could rent the house in town for decent money. Right. And I could build this house that would be worth, I don't remember what at the time, you know, but if I built, if I built this new house, it would raise up my net worth. I don't remember how I heard about net worth. It was never from my family. And I didn't know about net worth until maybe I was 32 or three. It's it interesting because you're actually without any business training, right? You've learned how to create businesses, make them profitable, sell them at a gain, go to the next thing. And this is without any training. Nobody, nobody mentored you. Nobody did anything. Yeah. No, you talk this never, on yourself. Yeah. I've never really been, I don't know how to say it. I'm not trying to sound like I'm really smart or anything. I, I wish that I could have spent my young adult life with people who are better than me, like up, mm -hmm. uh, up a couple mm -hmm. notches mm -hmm. that I could look at and learn from instead of just my mom called it by guess and by golly. I don't. <laughs> by I, guess and by golly. <laughs> yes. I yeah. don't know how I did it because my parents, who would be my role models, were not against me, but into safety. Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I understand yeah. completely. Yeah. yeah, why do you have yes. to own the hair salon? Just work there. You're going to yes. have all the bills now. Because that's you how know. they, that's how their programs said the, the life should be, right? That's how they figure it. And they're telling you that to protect you because yeah. that's, they're, they're protecting you. And yet you just couldn't help yourself. Now let's talk about what happened. How do you end up, because you became like this huge insurance agent too. Are you going into insurance now? No, no. There's more no. between that? Yeah. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hit me with it, Peggy. Hit me with it. Okay, so then I, um, I, I was my own contractor when I built the house because I didn't have enough money to just go, oh, I'm going to build a house and go find a builder. So right. I had to become a contractor, hire my own people. I did have Dean's uncle help me a ton. He was a really smart man and he loved me. He, he, mm -hmm. lo he loved Dean, so he loved me. You know, So he was helping me uh, with Dean's legacy, I guess. Um, and that house that I built was out in the country where he lived. So uncle Bill, super awesome guy, totally helped me. And, uh, I became a septic tank installer because they wouldn't give me a permit to, for the homeowner's permit to install my own septic system. 
the guy was just mean. So anyway, so I did that. I got the house built. So wait, and that- wait, 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 wait. So they wouldn't give you, well, you can't just skip through this. So, they, <laughs> okay, didn't so Homer, give you, they didn't give you the license to put in your own septic tank. So you became a what? You became a, a septic license, tank? A <laughs> so, septic tank installer. Well, okay. because, okay, the homeowner is allowed to put in their own septic system. Dig a drain field and put in their septic system. And I went to go get my permit and the guy goes, who's going to do this for you? And I said, me. He goes, you're not going to do this. And I go, no, I am. I've rented a backhoe. I've got everything. I just need the permit. I know how to do it. I, here's my plans. No, I don't believe that you're going to do it. And I'm like, well, I am. And he goes, well, you need a license to do it. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I probably weighed like 110 and a 36 year old woman. He just didn't believe I was driving a, a taco hooch or anything. I really was though, you know? So anyways, he made me pass the test to be a a septic tank installer so i brought the stuff home i studied it all i went back and got it like 89 on the test or something wow. and he goes you only needed a 70 you studied too hard and gave me <laughs> so, I, I mean i want you to think about identity we're talking so you are definitely an entrepreneurial identity right because you're not one thing you're like, like okay how can i increase my income how can i create my side hustle how can i create my streams of income. So it wasn't like you had one thing, you had several things, but you liked them all, correct? Yeah, luckily I like everything. It's yeah. really great. And that, so anyways, after I did that, um, I then I lived out in the country with my kids. Well then, mm-hmm. Melissa, you know, she got old enough and she didn't, she didn't ever really live here with us because she was like 19 when I built the house. So okay. she just didn't move with me from town. She stayed there. Actually, she rented the little apartment at the other house from me. There you go. So, yeah, that's what she did. Yeah. So then she learned how to pay rent and take care of her own apartment. It was really inexpensive, of course. Anyway, so then um, the other kids and I lived out here, but I was so lonesome. Mm-hmm. So then I bought a, um, I think I refinanced the house out here. I can't remember, but I bought another hair salon with okay. a friend of mine. And I said, if we owned it together, I could just work part-time and she could work part-time. She wasn't a hairdresser. And so she could keep the books and I could just make money doing hair. But then we didn't get along good in the partnership. So then we ended up selling that. Um, We only had it about six months. Probably didn't make any profit on that. That wasn't a good idea. So anyways, I'm like, okay, well, I'm just going to move back into town. So I moved, my renters moved out of the house. So I moved back into that house. And oh, while I was still working at that hair salon, another person said, oh, you should buy my house. If you just finished building that house out in Washington, you should buy my house. It needs a whole bunch of work. Well, let me look at it. So I went over and looked at that and I got that house from her. She uh, was a, she was one of my clients from my other salon that had found me and followed me there. So she said, just start working on it. I'll sign whatever paper you want and you need to pay me in six months. Wow. Seriously? Okay. So I got that and I made a real good profit off that, a really good profit from that. And so then I found another house and I did it again. And then one day I was just sitting home minding my own business, wondering what I was going to do next. And an old friend of mine called me and said, Hey, I'll sell you this house for 150,000. I'm like, it's worth like 250. And she goes, "Ah, I'm in in Alaska. I paid 48,000. You can have it for 150. I'm like, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went over there, bought that, fixed that all up, sold that, split the lot. Yeah, I made a profit off that. Then that's how I got my money to buy my Allstate agency. So now, so I want to get them up to, to the insurance because you became a maverick in the insurance in this, but you always worked, right? You were always working, but you always kind of controlled everything you worked on. You became your own contractor. You became your own real estate person. You became, you took out like a lot of pieces of where uh, we would lose money on, right? You would you made it all work for you in that aspect, correct? Yeah, you have to be really careful and make sure that you're not just saying yes. You have to take a risk, you know, nothing ventured, Mm -hmm. nothing gained, but you have to um, think about the cost compared to the gain and make sure that you're not gonna lose everything over one bad deal, which I know some people do. So I was always worried about that because I had to take care of my kids. And I forgot to tell you that during that time that I was doing those uh, last two or three houses, Mm -hmm. um, I went to college and got my bachelor's degree. And so during all this, you went and got a bachelor's degree too. Yeah. And so I, so now let's go into insurance a little bit. Now for everybody listening, 
Um, this is the first part of us talking to Peggy because we're talking on identity and I'm just kind of want you to see her life or how she got to where she's going. And next week, we're going to talk on perception, how to change your perception. We're going to get into a lot of her, uh, the way she does things, some of her tricks of the trade, some of the things she <laughs> teaches other people on how to become successful like this. Because you're understanding that she didn't have, if you're looking at her life story, anybody can do this. You just have to, you have to get smart, right? You're not, it's no, it's not, there's luck. Is there luck? Yeah, I guess there's luck. There was always luck, right? But you have to be pretty smart in your decisions that you're making. So tell us a little bit about, we've got about five minutes. Let's go into the insurance business a little bit. Okay, so I went and got my degree and I was going to get a job. And my brother says, I don't know why you're going to get a job. If you get a job from someone else, you're going to end up getting fired, you know. You don't know how to work for anyone. You know how to work for yourself. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I never considered I'd get fired. My cousin told me, um, I don't know why you spent all that money on a degree. Being an insurance agent is the best business in the world. While people are sleeping, oh, you hear that? Somebody just made their payment. I just got paid. Yeah. I was like, what? What? So then yeah. he told me about that. And I was thinking about that. I researched it. And I'm like, gosh, that would be an awesome job for me. I love people. And I always went back and thought about it. When I went to the real estate school, it was a real estate school. It was a lobby real estate on one side, insurance on the other. And I went and signed up for real estate school, but I accidentally went in the insurance school and I did like two days worth of insurance school <laughs> before I went back to the lady and I go, what am I going to start learning about real estate? So I always wondered, was God trying to push me into insurance back then? I don't know. But anyways, um, I bought an all-state agency, loved it, loved it, loved it, loved it. Um, I loved the people. I loved helping them understand it because I never understood it. I, I mm -hmm. just loved, I, I loved all of it. I, I liked having employees and I just worked as hard as I could to be as good as I could. And I end up winning trips and getting top honors like several times. I ended up getting asked to go help other people who were starting. Um, yeah, I loved it. it very, very fulfilling. But really stressful because when you build your agency up from a little tiny agency and then you have a bigger agency and you need more employees and you're counting more and more on other people doing the job yes, for it changes you, things for you, right? It really changed things for me. And I realized I am kind of a control freakish person. <laughs> you're actually, I, I think you're focused control, but I wouldn't say control. I'd say you're pretty focused. And so, yeah. I, and so this is, as we, are we closing out this episode? One of the things I want to introduce everybody to Peggy, and we're going to really next week get into some of her things in perception, the things that she teaches her belief systems, how she changed her identity to this person. And now you are, you're, you're with, I want to touch on the insurance a little bit um, more next week because how you built the agencies and then sell the agencies, go in and build the agencies and then sell the agencies. And you're always in this expansion. You always live in like this expansion, entrepreneurial mindset. You have a growth mindset. Now you're out to help others achieve that. That's, am I correct on that? I love helping people. Yeah. Love, so, love, 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 love. I so think everybody can do great. And I just want them to. And, and the thing is, you're going to do this transition you're doing and you're working on your book called The Guardian Angel. And this is the, a book. And, and I know that you have a lot of focus towards women because you just kind of believe that they just, a lot of women get stuck. They don't believe they can do it. And you want to be right. that example. But it's everybody. You actually have a nonprofit organization that is, is, is called OkayToDream.org which is yes. an organization to help people that are stuck down to help them grow, right? Yeah, we call, we call it um, giving you, not giving you a hand out, but giving you a hand up. Yes. So I just love yep. helping people. I help them budget. I help them learn how to have some confidence and self-esteem. We do small workshops. My sister Jenny helps me because she's yes. great. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to talk about we her next her. week. We're going to talk about the family next week. That's what I want to talk about because next week we're going to talk on perception. And, uh, and, and Peggy is going to be amazing when she, as you could tell, you know, she's going to be successful because she's going to figure out how it works, you know, and she's going to make it work because that's what she does. But I want to talk next week. We're going to talk about how she grew herself and how 
their certain members in her family followed her, how she gave them permission to grow. We're going to talk about your two sisters that have been just absolutely stunningly following your example, right? <laughs> Jennifer and Kelly. So we'll talk about them a little bit next week. Get permission that we could talk about them. Don't, don't want any fights starting, right? But, <laughs> but, you know, but it's, it's an amazing story. Peggy, I'm so grateful to have you on the show and thank you so much. If you had to thank give... You for me. If you had to give one message for to close out this particular episode, and we talk about identity, right? You have to give that person listening one message thinking on, what the heck? How do I become like that? What would your message be to them? My message would be, don't be too afraid to take a step. If you don't like where you are, take a step out of it. If yep. you're not yep. going where... If you're not going where you'd like to be, then just have the guts to be bold and just take one step. Right, just that, take that's one step. Great. What a great piece of advice. And we're, next week, we'll, we're, our, our topic next week is perception. And we're going to talk about how do you change your perception? You know, how do you change your perception from being in, in, in being this, this housewife and all of a sudden overnight you become this entrepreneur? And obviously it wasn't overnight, but you change your perception. And you said something very important is once you got confidence, you were off. And right. that's taking your so once you got the confidence you're off so it her name is peggy romero uh her book that will be coming out next year will be um amazing i i, I privy because i get to read some of it so and she's a heck of a writer i just want you guys to know that she's a great writer so the guardian angel book is really about how it's a lot about her story how she got out of this but also her methods and, and Peggy's methods, what do we call them? Peggy's, Peggy something. Her methods are that, because she's got tools that she uses. There are really tools. She's very big goal setter. She uses a lot of the things that we teach in Stress Mastery. Uh, she is very good with visualization. And I will tell you, and, we'll, and I don't want to get too far ahead, but I want to set you guys up for next week's show, is the energy that Peggy mastered. And each of you can master this energy. And when you master this energy, you create transformation. We're going to talk about it next week. She mastered that 250 neutrality energy. When you master that energy, that's the energy of flexibility. And you heard just what her advice was, right? Take the step. If the step's not right, step out. That is neutrality and flexibility. And once you master that energy, the energy rises. You can do anything. You can transform anything. And we'll talk about that next week. How do you create that perception that you can master that energy? Because you're scared when you take that first step, correct? Penny? Of course you are, right? Mm -hmm. Of course you're scared. So every first step, you're scared. Every <laughs> first step, right? Even when you were a baby, you had to have a little bit of fear that you're going to fall on your butt. You have to take your first step. So thank you so much, Peggy. I'm looking forward to next week. Guys, stay tuned. Next week, we'll talk. Uh, we'll continue. Peggy Romero. Um, if you want to get a hold of her, just contact us because we're she's putting together her stuff, and I'll make sure she, she connects with you. Okay. And Thank next you, week, man. and next week we we'll probably have a little bit more for them. Correct. Yep. <laughs> okay. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is the greatest shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by like, share, subscribe. The links are right below the show. As always, until next time, stay inspired.